Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message on a Sunday service. Uh, the title of this morning's message is Using Our God-Given Authority for Finance. We started there three weeks ago. Um, talking about sowing a seed to meet a need, then we are now talking about finances and the authority that God has given to us as believers. The subtitle of today's message is still principles of prosperity. That's what they are. They are principles. Uh, and the question is asked, what about the next generation? What about the next generation? I want to speak to you about that today. A very quick recap, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, it is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by one man, Jesus Christ, all who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ. God wants us to rule in life through Christ. If you're born again, you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You have repented of your sins. You've been adopted into God's family. You're now a son or a daughter of the Most High God. God wants us to rule in life. He wants us, in the Old Testament, He says, I'll make you the head, not the tail, to be above only and not beneath. So God's given us authority. And we said that authority that God's given to us is not just to be able to exercise dominion over Satan and demon spirits or sickness and disease, which certainly does all of that. Uh, but God also wants us to exercise dominion over our finances. God wants us to be in charge. The finance is not to be in charge of us. All right. The money is not to rule us. We rule the money. Uh, and of course, Jesus there is a quick reminder. Jesus says we cannot serve two masters. Um, and then last week specifically, we made three main points. Uh, I want to quickly recap on that. We said that it is God's will that all of his people will prosper. Um, all of his people. Number two, we talked about operating the principle of seed time and harvest. And number three, let us see, uh, we said what to do after you have sown a financial seed. I'm certainly not planning to re-preach the message, but if you haven't uh, got to it yet, we'd encourage you uh, to watch it, uh, listen to it. It's sitting up on our YouTube channel. It is also available on Spotify and a couple of other platforms. Now, this morning, I want to speak to you about, uh, uh, as part of the, this message here, uh, about God's plan for our finances being intergenerational. Everybody say intergenerational. All right, so it's intergenerational. Um, God thinks not in terms of individuals or one generation. God thinks in terms of generations, plural. All right, and I believe God wants us to adopt that same way of thinking. Uh, I want to start in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22, where it says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. All right, I want to focus on the first half of that verse. There is a whole message in the second half that we might get to at some point, but I want to focus on the first half. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. In other words, for his grandchildren. Now, how many good men do we have in the house here today? All right, <laughs> praise God. So, so uh, uh, let me just uh, say that uh, socialism is a political philosophy and is a lifestyle socialism in principle is against the accumulation of personal wealth. And by the way, we live in a socialist country. If you haven't woken up, uh, we live in a socialist country. Uh, of course, socialism, you, they say, what is that? Well, it's communism. Uh, uh, it's all the same Marxism. You know, that crazy philosophy that the crazy German uh, uh, man called Karl Marx has, has devised. Uh, um, it's all the same thing. You get the soft version, you get the medium version, and you get the hard version. And I'll let you pick which one we've got in our nation. Socialism. And people say, well, how many socialists are there? In my estimation, too many. Okay, too many. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk about that some other time as we get a bit closer to the election. But let me say for now, uh, socialism is against the accumulation of wealth uh, in, in terms of personal wealth. Yet God says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. Personally, I like to be educated by the word of God rather than by socialism or any other ism there is. We have many isms. 
all right? But we have the Bible. And you and I as God's people, uh, we need to disconnect from a lot of these isms. uh, And many Christians have fallen prey to these isms because what they teach, some of it is very clever. It sounds good on the surface, but you dig beneath the surface and you will find that there is a lot of rot in there and a lot of anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christ sort of practices that are being promoted. So this means that if a good man leaves an inheritance uh, to his grandchildren, it means that a good man must accumulate wealth and leave it as an inheritance. All right? Because if the good man only lives from the hand to the mouth, uh, which is what is being promoted just about, uh, then what will he give when he gets to the end of his life or at some point when he feels to hand over an inheritance? All right, what's also interesting uh, is this, that uh, in God's intergenerational plan, our children should be given an, an inheritance by our parents. All right, I hope this is not complicated. And by the way, this is not a rule. Uh, this is just principles that we see in the Word of God. Uh, and the thing is, well, if, if our parents give our, our children an inheritance, then what about us? Well, we should have been given an inheritance by our grandparents. Intergenerational, that not a single generation misses out. Now, of course, this is in an ideal world. All right. In many instances, many of us have not received much of anything at all. Uh, and, and yet God is still able to prosper us. But it is so much easier for young people when they get a good head start to whatever extent that we're able to help them. And my heart certainly goes out to today's generation in terms of young people that are coming up and, 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 and so forth. Now, what's interesting, too, is that successive governments, uh, uh, and certainly in New Zealand uh, and, and also in other in in other places and spaces, they have kind of conditioned whole generations uh, to live from the hand to the mouth and to not prepare for a prosperous future. What was said in terms of preparing for retirement and for old age, what was said decades, decades, decades ago, say, give us a little extra tax money and we will put aside and we will feed you when you retire. Um, it's called national super, all right, uh, superannuation. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm not saying it. But, but, the, but somehow uh, this is all a philosophy. You kind of wonder how that uh, sits with the word of God because God wants us to be able to accumulate wealth so we can look after our own selves and not only that, but be able to look after the next generation in terms of uh, being able to pass something on. Now, for good measure, let me read another scripture here in Psalm 100. 12 verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, who greatly, let me start again, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. That's a powerful verse of Scripture. I don't know about you, but I get excited when I read these things. Okay? In fact, in one translation, it says in the latter part, it says, and his prosperity endures forever. Now, uh, to start at the beginning of these three verses, that basically tells us that somebody who fears the Lord uh, and, uh, and delights greatly in God's commandments or in God's word is blessed, all right? That is the starting point. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible tells us, okay? And, uh, and then it goes on to say, it speaks about the man who fears the Lord. It says, his descendants will be mighty upon the earth. Now notice, the Bible speaks about a man who fears the Lord, or a good man, and in the very next mouthful, it speaks about his descendants. There's a kind of a a very quick from one to the other, because God thinks intergenerationally, okay? And actually, this is a good verse uh, for you to embrace and to confess over your children, over your children's children, that our descendants shall be mighty upon the earth. This is a confession that I've confessed over my children for many years, that my children are mighty upon the earth. All right? Mighty. Uh, And the term David's mighty man come to to mind. uh, And the whole might in terms of powerful and being able to be involved 
at uh, the top levels of society rather than to scratch around the bottom um, and have to be fed by the government. How many know what I'm talking about? So, you see, God is able to do wonderful things, and no matter where you sit today in the socioeconomic ladder, if there is such a thing, be encouraged. God is able to do amazing things, but it needs to begin in our thinking. It needs to begin in our heart. Prosperity doesn't start with money. It starts by a prosperous soul. And we covered that a couple of weeks ago. The prosperity begins on the inside, and then it wants to be worked through to the outside of our lives and go into our circumstances, into, into all of our affairs. So God wants to prosper us, not just for our sake, but for the sake of our children and our children's children. Notice how it says here, wealth and riches will be in his house. Now, I cannot be, even begin to tell you how many Christians I've talked to say, oh, we don't want to be wealthy. Well, it seems that this guy didn't have a problem with wealth. All right. Oh, we don't want, to, we don't want too much. You know, it might, it might corrupt us. Well, it can. It can. But I have seen many poverty-stricken uh, people who also corrupt it. So, it, you know, it's, it's not the money. It's the attitude towards the money. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Not the money, it's the love of money. And one way that I keep the love of money away from me all the days of my life is to bring the tithe into the house every time. Then, and the, the love of money doesn't get near me. All right, that is the starting point for me. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, God wants wealth and riches in our houses. And I think we should be totally comfortable with the idea of wealth and riches, that we're not against it. We, we haven't taken a, a false sort of a humbleness about, oh, we don't want that, because uh, that is a false humbleness, we, uh, a humility, uh, and we haven't taken a sort of an anti-scriptural sort of a stance and just made up our own mind because God wants to prosper Every single believer. And God is not just thinking about you. He's thinking about your children and your ch grandchildren. In fact, your whole posterity. All right. Should the Lord tarry. All right. Then, you know, Jesus said, you know, some people say, oh, you know, that's not so necessary anymore now. Jesus is coming any day now. And no, Jesus, well, he, he can come any day. But Jesus says, occupy till I come. <laughs> occupy till I come. Keep busy. Keep busy. Uh, and allow God to lead you uh, on these paths that we are discussing here today. And again, for good measure, here's another scripture here, Psalm 25, verse 12. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways that they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Very powerful. Very powerful. It says that God instructs those who fear him. So again, fearing the Lord. Now, the, the, the best thing that we as parents and as grandparents can pass on is not wealth and money. It is a heart that fears the Lord. All right? That we teach our children and our grandchildren to be God-fearing. And the word fear there is probably better translated respect. That we have a high respect for God. A high respect for His Word. A high respect for the Holy Spirit and for the ways of God. And therefore, we bring a high respect for the local church that we're a part of. And for the things of God as a whole. A high respect for the gospel. A high respect for the things of God. All right. The Bible says here that those who fear the Lord, God will lead them. He will instruct them in the way that they should choose. You see, certain things in life we can choose. It's not like, oh, God, you know, uh, whatever you say, uh, you know, that will happen. Well, not automatically. There's many things that don't happen automatically. God wants us to choose. God says, choose you this day whom you will serve. All right. And of course, uh, uh, Joshua of old, he says, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. So Joshua determined that he was not going to serve the Lord himself. He was going to command his whole household after him, which means his children and his grandchildren, that he set a pace. He says, this is the pace that we are going. All right. Now, I could bounce off of in all directions now at this point. All right. Uh, but fathers in particular, 
you're a role model. And your children will not do as you say. In the end, they will end up doing what you do. All right, so, so let's model a lifestyle of the fear of the Lord. Let's model a, ri- a lifestyle of respect for God, respect for his word, and respect for the things of God. All right, so um, it says they will spend uh, their days in prosperity. Who are they? Well, the ones who fear the Lord, whom God has taught and instructed in the way that they should choose. Uh, see, when I look back in my own, my own, li- uh, in, in my own life, not old life, my, my own life, uh, there's a few decisions that Vanessa and I made. Uh, we made some good decisions along the way. A couple of them, I think, oh, we could have done a bit better there. And it could have possibly worked out uh, a little better. Things could have been a little bit easier. We could have probably advanced economically a bit faster if we had made a good decision in a couple of instances there. Though, you know, uh, I'm not one to second guess things. I'm just saying, God, you know, just lead me today, Lord. Whatever has gone in the past, you know, if, if I've done wrong, I repent of it. Lord, forgive me for ignoring the leading of your spirit, but just help me from this day forward. Help me to make good decisions, Lord. Uh, and, uh, so, and so that's kind of, uh, when it speaks here, it says uh, that they will spend their days in prosperity and their descendants will inherit the land. Again, Again, speaking about one who fears the Lord, one whom God teaches on the path uh, to that they, sh- that they should choose, they live their days in prosperity and his descendants. Again, next mouthful, and his descendants will inherit the land. What is land? Land is prosperity. <laughs> A friend of mine uh, uh, says, get the dirt, get the dirt, get the dirt. All right, so that's kind of his way of saying, get land, get land, get land. Um, And hopefully it's got a house on it. Hallelujah, Jesus. All right. So, uh, and then it goes on to say, uh, it says, and the Lord confides in those who fear him, um, and uh, he makes known his covenant to us. God wants to teach us his covenant. And God's covenant is not just a single covenant. does not just cover a single area, but it is a whole package. And people speak about salvation and praise God for salvation. Going to heaven is wonderful, but it's not the whole deal. There's much more included. It is a salvation package. Uh, um, The Bible speaks uh, in the New Testament of a uh, a Greek word called life. Uh, Well, the Greek word is sozo. Sozo is life absolute. All right, life absolute, and it includes healing, it includes deliverance, it includes prosperity, it includes pro- protection. All of that is included in God's covenant. All right, God wants to teach us his covenant. Let me bring up that uh, scripture again that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, Deuteronomy 8, 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Friends, prosperity is a covenant issue. All right? To God, it's a covenant issue. People say, oh, do I want it? Do I not want it? It's a covenant issue. It is available. All right? It's like many other things. See, healing is a covenant issue. It belongs to us by covenant. But not everybody gets it. Not everybody, you know, it's by faith that we receive these things. We reach out by faith to lay a hold of the covenant promises. Uh, I was just again in our prayer meeting this morning, reminded of Psalm 103, where it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. They're benefits for us who are God's covenant people, who forgives all our iniquities, that's forgiveness of sins, who heals all of our diseases, that's healing, who crowns our life with loving kindness and retain the mercies, that's a covenant benefit. And it goes on from there. So it says, there's just one other scripture there that comes into this whole issue there. See, prosperity is a covenant issue. It is available by covenant. It is available not because you and I are wonderful. It's because Jesus is wonderful. All right. He's the one that is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And what he has done on the cross. And just before he went to the cross, 
And he sat down with his disciples that were there at the time with the 12, and he uh, established a new covenant with them. And from that, we get that whole term of communion. Uh, it was a Passover meal. It became the Christian ordinance of communion, the sharing of the bread, the sharing of the wine. Take, he says, drink of this. This is the cup of a new covenant. And eat uh, this bread, he says. This is, this is my body which is broken for you. And the, 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 the content of, the, of the, what we call the emblems of the cup represents the blood of Jesus. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken. The blood that was shed, the body was broken. Sacrificially. That you and I could be saved through what Jesus done on the cross of Calvary. And you and I could be healed because of what he's done. Because the Bible says that the stripes that were laid on his body, it is by his stripes, it is by his wounds that we have been healed. Healing is available. Prosperity is available. It's all available, but it is available by faith. So let me uh, swing on into the uh, book of Genesis where God makes a covenant with uh, Abraham and with his descendants. And this is now a series of scriptures that I want to read, make a couple of comments, and the Bible explains itself better than what I could explain it. Uh, uh, but I want to talk about that because here in, in Genesis 17, uh, verse 7 and 8, he says, and God says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation. God speaking to Abraham. God says, say, Abraham, you and I, we're going to get into covenant. God initiated it. Abraham agreed to it. And God says, it, my covenant with you is not just for you, Abraham. It'll be for your descendants, generation after generation after generation. I think this is one of the more exciting aspects of the whole word of God is the whole, the whole deal of covenants. And when we study all of that through and read all of that through, that God, each time a new generation arose, God visited them and reestablished the covenant. And then they grew old and then a new generation arose and God established his covenant with the next generation and then with the next generation. All right, because God thinks intergenerationally. He says, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and you, to your descendants after you. And I will give your descendants after you the land. Here it is, speaking to Abraham and immediately speaking to him about his descendants. Uh, to the, the land, he says, in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And here in verse 17, uh, verse 19, it goes on to talk about at that stage, you know, Abraham didn't have a son, uh, and uh, he didn't have an heir. He had nobody to pass on his Wealth, because uh, he grew very, very wealthy. Uh, and when God said to him, uh, God says to Abraham, Abraham, he says, I'm your shield and I'm your exceedingly great reward. And God uh, and Abraham turned around. You know, God and Abraham are on talking terms. And God says, uh, rather, Abraham says one day, God, he says, what will you give me since I go childless? And uh, my heir is this Eliezer of Damascus, like a servant, a servant, he says, I'm going to give everything to my servant because I haven't got any children. God says, no, you're going to have a son. And he promised him a son. Uh, and of course, there's a whole story there where it didn't happen for a while. And then Abraham's wife tried to help him out and say, ah, oh, it's not happening. Abraham, go and here's my servant girl. Go and produce the son with her. Uh, and he did. And uh, that son <coughs> was called Ishmael, became the father of the uh, Arab nations, um, and uh, it's interesting when, you know, when yeah, it's just, uh, you know, the, the, there's a book that's been written called The Price of a Decision. When we get into the flesh, we end up, uh, there'll be something that will, you know, that there'll, there'll be some issue arising out of it because God blesses uh, what's in the spirit. God doesn't bless the flesh. Uh, though as it stood, uh, God says to Abraham, all right, he says, I will bless Ishmael uh, because he's your seed, but, but he's not the son of the covenant. He's, 
you're going to have a, a son with Sarah. Uh, and so here he says uh, in verse 19, uh, Genesis 17, God says, No, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his and with his descendants after him. And so it now goes from one generation to the next generation. Uh, Genesis 25, I'm just skipping along. Verse 11, it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. Now the, the, the next guy. The next generation. All right. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahoi Roy, uh, if that's how you pronounce it. Genesis 26, verse 1. It says, And there was a famine in the land because the first famine uh, that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the uh, of Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in the land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all of these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to your father to Abraham, your father. So you see what's happening here. God repeats what he said to Abraham, reveals himself now to Isaac, as he said he would, and what he promised to Abraham was going to be true to Isaac, to Jacob, and to the 12 sons, and on from there. All right. And uh, in, in Genesis 26, verse 12, Isaac sold in that land. Now, uh, as a background, the Bible says there was famine in the land. When there was famine in the land, the typical route was go down to Egypt because there's food down there. The famine doesn't reach down there. And, and, and Isaac would have headed in that direction, but God says, no, no, no. I don't want you to choose that path. I have a better path for you. Stay in the land. And the Bible says that... Uh, Isaac sold in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and God blessed him. What is a hundredfold? He throw out one sack of uh, wheat or one sack of grain, and he bring in a hundred sacks. Hundredfold. In that land. Famine days, remember. In famine days, hardly anybody reaped. But he not only reaped, but he reaped very well. Why? Because the blessing of God is on him. God's leading him and guiding him. Could he have done that in Egypt? Maybe not. You see, when, when people step outside of the will of God, the blessings are in the will of God. And sometimes it doesn't take much to trigger Christians and they step out of the will of God. Through some offense, something is said, something is done, off they go, and, and now they're out of the will of God. And many of them try to find their way back into it again, but they spend a lot of time in the wilderness. My friend, my brother, my sister, stay in the will of God. That's where the blessing is. Stay with the program. Stay in faith. Thank you, Jesus. I thought that was exciting. Uh, anyway, um, I'll just carry on. I'll just carry on. <laughs> and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, verse 13, and continue prospering until he became very prosperous. This is amazing. This is amazing. There's something on that boy. I was listening to Creflo Dollar who toured around some of these, uh, the blessing of Abraham and different things. And, you know, it's only the blacks can in America. He says, oh, man, he says, there's something on that boy. He said, uh, you know, other people did all right. Other, many people did not do well, but he exceeded them all because there's something on him. What was it? It was the blessing of God. God visited him. He revealed his covenant to him. And, and Isaac bought into it, so to speak, agreed with it. Uh, and the blessing began to flow. Verse 20, uh, Genesis 25, verse 19. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of uh, Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife that she conceived uh, because she was barren rather, and the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, of course, Rebekah, we know, uh, Isaac had, uh, had two children. Uh, one of them was Jacob. The other one was Esau. There was a whole story behind all of that, how that pregnancy panned out and how the delivery panned out. And there was a prophecy there that the younger was going to serve, uh, the older was going to serve the young and so forth. We haven't got time to get into the details of it, but uh, uh, it's all turned out that, uh, that, uh, Jacob managed to 
st almost steal or wrestle the birthright off of his older brother called Isaac. What's the birthright? Well, amongst other things, it's a double portion. Esau, sorry. What did I say? Okay, so it's, it's Jacob and Esau. So Jacob stole the birthright off of Esau. And then when uh, uh, Isaac, the father, got older, he called his older son Esau to him, who was a hunter. And he says, oh, Esau, he says, the days of my departure, you know, not that far away. I don't know when I'm going to die, but I want to bless you. Uh, he says, why don't you go out into the field uh, because you're a hunter. Go and get game and cook it up for me like you do because I love that. And when I've eaten the game, I'm going to bless you. Uh, and there was a whole story behind it how the mother Rebecca overheard all of that. Now the older boy goes out into the field and the mother says to the younger boy, quickly, get me a, get me a, a couple of a, a sheep, a couple of a goats, uh, and I will be prepare it. And then you go into the father and tell him that you're Esau and he will bless you. And then, you know, the blessing will come on you. And there's a whole story behind all of that. Uh, a bit tricky, really, uh, which is interesting because even sometimes in amongst all the trickiness, God still blesses. Sometimes people expect to be perfect uh, in their own lives. You know, just make good decisions, but, but let's be the best that we can be in terms of our in, uh, character, in terms of our personality, in terms of our integrity. But God is still able to cause the blessings to flow if our attitude is right towards him. Well, it turned out that Jacob did manage to trick his father into blessing him with the blessing of the firstborn instead of Esau, his older brother. Now the older brother is livid. He's angry. He said, in his, I'm going to kill. As soon as my father's died, I'm going to kill Jacob. And so <laughs> the mother heard that. She says to Jacob, uh, she says, oh, Jacob, uh, um, don't marry one of, the, one of the ladies from the land. I want you to you know, marry one from your uncle Laban and so forth. So she tells uh, um, she tells uh, Isaac, she says, Isaac, I don't want... Uh, uh, Jacob to marry one of the girls from the land. I want I want him to marry one of our uh, you know relatives back you know from Laban's days. So the father says, okay, Jacob, why don't you go out and go and find yourself a woman over there? And so he's sent away. All right, that's sort of the very quick version. It's a wonderful reading in Genesis from chapter 25 onwards. In fact, earlier all the way through to chapter 35. I'd encourage you if you haven't got a Bible reading plan, read that. It will encourage you. All right, and uh, so here is Jacob now. Uh, and he's out on his way to Laban, his uncle, uh, the brother of his mother. Um, and uh, Jacob had a dream, uh, Genesis 28, verse 12. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Why does God say that? Because he's about to lead up to talk about the covenant that he's had with Jacob's grandfather and with his father, about to reveal the same thing. He says, And the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Also your descendants will be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. Uh, and of course, ultimately, the Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the anointed one, was going to arise out of that bloodline uh, and, and so forth, and that's reference to that uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, he says, Behold, verse 15, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done all that I have spoken to you. God is completely committed to you and to me as his covenant partners. God does not want to leave us. In fact, he doesn't leave us. Jesus, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But God wants to do what he's spoken in his word. Um, 
and, uh, and of course, Abraham, uh, Jacob now like, has got a decision to make. Am I going to buy into this covenant like my father did and like my grandfather did? And he decided he would. Um, and Jacob uh, made a vow, uh, Genesis 28 verse 20, saying, God, if God will be with me and keep me in the way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I will come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So he's now reciprocating the commitment. God says to, to Jacob, I'm committed to you. And Jacob says, Lord, I'm committed to you. If you will do all of that, and I believe you will, I am committed. Uh, the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. Now, here's an interesting point. Abraham, uh, rather Jacob, not only commits to the Lord to, as it were, to, 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 to follow him and to serve him, but he also commits to be a tithe. Of everything that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth. So he made a commitment. He made a commitment. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit. He's on his way to Laban's house. He's at Laban's house for 20 years until he comes back. And just before he leaves, God recalls back the words that Jacob spoke to God 20 years later, word for word. And my friend, if you've made a commitment to the Lord, I'd encourage you to keep your commitment. God does not forget, let's not you and I vow a vow and then not keep it. The Bible says it is better not to vow a vow than to vow a vow and to not keep it. Let's be committed uh, to God uh, as he is committed to us. So when Jacob came to his uncle Laban, he served him for 20 years. I'm moving quickly now. I want to get to the end of this message here. We are running out of time. Probably taking more time than what I should have in other, in other areas. But you know, uh, uh, Laban was Jacob's uncle. Laban was a crooked man. He was a shrewd man. Uh, he had a farm. He had livestock. He had servants. Um, he wasn't all doing all that well, but he did all right. And when Jacob came into his house and started to then commit to his uncle, and he said to his uncle, because Laban said, what, what shall I pay you if you serve me, you know, if you look after my livestock and so forth? He says, he says look, you shall not pay me anything, he says. Uh, he says, but I want to serve you for seven years for your younger daughter. I want to marry your younger daughter. Uh, and so he served him for seven years. Laban tricked him, uh, and on the wedding night, he didn't bring in the younger daughter. He brought in the older daughter called Leah. Um, the pretty one was the younger one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Laban brings the other one in. Uh, and anyway, in the morning, uh, Jacob gets up and says, Oh, what, what have you done, Laban? You've given me the older one, and I've served you for the younger one. And, uh, and then uh, Laban says, Oh, well, look, in our country, he says, We don't give the younger one away before the older one. He said, Made a bit of an excuse. And so, anyway, so, so uh, Jacob, being a, a, a good man, uh, uh, he says, Okay, he says, I will serve you another seven years for the younger one. Uh, so he served him another seven years. Is now 14 years serving. You know, it's a kind of a dowry, that sort of, that sort of arrangement. Um, and uh, <laughs> I've got to make sure I don't get sidetracked here. I could say some funny things, but I could be in trouble afterwards. Uh, you know, people, people take offense because I'm having fun about things that can be very serious to people. Uh, so anyway, so I served him for seven years more. It's now the end of 14 years. So Laban gives his younger daughter uh, to Jacob to marry. And now, you know, now he's got two wives. Uh, as it turned out, each one of them came with uh, uh, a servant girl each. So um, how do I say this? You know, God's plan is really one woman, okay? Not four, one woman. Uh, that's really God's plan. Uh, when the Bible speaks about uh, God has a wife, he doesn't say God has wives for, for each man. He's got a wife. Okay, one, just one. Okay. And so anyway, uh, so it turns out that uh, Jacob says, I want to go home. I want to go back to, to Isaac, to my father. I want to go back to my brother. And Laban said, oh, he says, don't leave. He says, God really blessed me because of you. He says, I, I, I've known by experience when you come into my household, God's begun to prosper me and bless me. You see, when we work at a company, we bring the presence of God in, into that place, and God wants to prosper the company. 
Uh, that's just what God does. We bring the presence of God. We bring the blessing of God with us. If we are aware of what's happening, uh, you see, we can enhance this when we begin to walk by faith. Uh, and so uh, uh, Laban says, okay, uh, all right, I'll stay for a while longer. Laban says, what shall I give you? He says, you shall not give me anything. He says, but here's what I would like to do. Um, I would like to, uh, if you let me go through your flocks, and if you let me take out all the spotted and all the speckled lamb and the brown ones amongst the goats, uh, and the colors don't matter, and spotted, speckled, uh, he says, I'm going to put those aside and they shall be mine. Well, in the Middle East, we are told at that time, most sheep were white. There wasn't hardly any speckled ones around, no spotted ones, and then that's the lambs and, 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 and the, the goats, and I don't understand all the details, but Laban thought he had a deal. He says, this is a good deal. There's hardly any speckled, hardly any sp spotted ones out there. Yep, take them away. He says, no problem, and, and Laban thought, ah, this is going to be good for me. Well, it turned out that, that uh, Jacob took out all the colored ones, uh, spe speckled, spotted brown ones, took them all away. Uh, three days journey between Laban's livestock and his own, and he put his sons in charge of his own livestock, and then he started to look after Laban's livestock. And there is a, then God gave the man a dream, and he began to speak to him to show him in regards to when the sheep come together to be watered in a certain place, and when they mate, uh, you know, with each other to produce more, 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 more lambs and so forth. God showed him a particular method, and the method doesn't matter so much because I don't want to get into the details, and some of it I don't fully understand. But when God gave that instruction to Jacob, it's exactly what Jacob did. And what happened was that Jacob, furthermore, uh, had a particular method that uh, he put certain things in front of the livestock when they produced, they ended up producing spotted and speckled ones rather than white ones, which meant the spotted and speckled ones were, were his. So he shipped them off to, to three days journey to his son's place and carried on. And then not only that, but the stronger ones, uh, the stronger flocks, uh, and farmers know the difference between the weak ones and the strong ones. The stronger ones, he used that method. So his flocks end up being very strong and uh, the weaker ones ended up being laid. Um, and so it was very clever how uh, Jacob worked it out, but God had instructed him. And of course, uh, when they struck up that deal, uh, Laban says to Jacob says to Laban, he says, look, he says, when I get to the end of my time, there's not going to be any, any argument. Whatever is spotted and speckled is mine. When I leave, I have stolen nothing from you. Whatever is spotted and speckled is mine. Whatever is white is yours. So there was like a clear dividing line. Well, as it turned out that that. Jacob increased tremendously. Again, there's something on that boy. What is that? It's the blessing of God. And not only that, but the wealth transferred from Laban, who was outside the covenant, over to Jacob, who was inside the covenant. It's about a covenant issue. And God clearly instructed Jacob what to do. It is a marvelous story. And it turned out now that uh, Laban's boys began to realize, that, oh, oh, this is not a good situation here. And they said that Jacob is stealing everything from our, from our father, but he hadn't. It's just a particular method that caused a transfer of wealth. Didn't the first verse that we read this morning that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just? And God has a method of getting that out of the hand of non-covenant people, wicked people, into the hands of his covenant people, which today is you and me. All right, I'm just throwing some of that out there. Some of it is a bit too much for people to get their head around without any teaching around it, but that's exactly what's happened here. All right, and so now Jacob heard that his sons were unhappy, and uh, the, he thought, gosh, I fear for my life here. He says, and for the lives of my family, and by now he's got a bunch of kids. He's got servants galore. Uh, he's got livestock, like unbelievable. He's just prospered tremendously. So he called his wives out to him in the field. He says, look, he says, things are not good. Your father is not happy. Um, and I now fear for my life. 
it's time to go. So he says, pack up, we're going to get out of here, <laughs> which they did. They packed up secretly, and they got out of there. Um, and, of course, there was another meeting that went down, and I haven't got time to get into the details with that. But anyway, he is now Jacob, closer to home. He's now left. He's got all his family with him. He's got all his stuff with him, and he's got a lot of stuff. I mean, livestock, just unbelievable how God has prospered the man. And uh, now he's getting scared that his brother will kill him because he remembered now that he had tricked his brother out of his birthright as well as out of his father's blessing. And, and, and then the word was, oh, Esau is on his way to meet you. He's heard that you're coming. And he's on his way to meet you, and he's got 400 men with him. <laughs> now Jacob is freaking out like, oh, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. So what he did was he divided... Um, his family and his livestock in between two companies, and he sent them on ahead. <laughs> so he says to the family, you go. I'll be at the back. You know, you know, man, we lead. All right? And our families follow. Well, Jacob had it this way around. Anyway, whatever that may be. Uh, he says, go ahead. And when Esau comes... And he will ask you, where you come from and where are you going and what is all of this stuff? Who does all of that belong to? Tell him. He says, your servant Jacob is on his way home again. And all this stuff belongs to Jacob and he wants to give it to you as a gift. <laughs> so he's not trying to appease his brother. And, and he says, and if he attacks the first company, then hopefully the second one will survive and get away. And so that was like his reasoning. Uh, <laughs> and, and now he's out there by himself. Uh, and there is actually a wrestling with God that's going on. I physically wrestle with God, and we haven't got time to get into the detail. But here is what he said, and I want to wrap this up very shortly. Genesis 32, uh, verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac. He's now sent all of his stuff ahead of himself, sent all of his family ahead of himself. He's now alone. And he now recalls the covenant that God made with his grandfather Abraham, with his father Isaac. He says, And the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. So he's developed a bit of humility there. Uh, because things had gone particularly well for him, uh, but he's developed a bit of humility. He says, uh, he says that you have shown me, uh, your servant, for I have crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I've become two companies. To me, that's a very powerful statement. Now, of course, he had his father back there. His father was very wealthy. His brother was very wealthy. There was potentially an inheritance. But actually, Jacob, when he left home, he left home with a stick in his hand and probably a backpack carrying some bread and some water. All right, they traveled light in those days. He goes over to his, uh, to his uncle's place and serves him for 20 years. After 14 years, he had uh, two wives, um, a number of children, and some livestock, but his prosperity did not really kick in in the last seven years. And then God made him in seven years... Um, uh, fought in actually six years because uh, he didn't quite stay to the 21st year. He left after the 20th year. And God made him extremely, extremely wealthy. And so my encouragement to you today is wherever you are in your journey, things might not be looking too good right now. Your boss could have even cheated you. Jacob says to his, to his girls, to his wives, uh, who were the, the daughters of uh, Laban, he says, your father has changed my wages 10 times. When he saw I was getting ahead this way, he changed it to that. When I was getting ahead that way, he says, he changed it again. But still, he says, God has prospered me. Jacob stayed true to his commitment, uh, and God led him, and God encouraged him, and God gave him, gave him wisdom where there was a transfer of wealth, uh, that all, this, all the things that he had worked for, he got paid for, not immediately and not as well as what one might hope, but God restored him everything that was due to him and beyond, and in the end, by the time that uh, Abraham, uh, should I say, uh, Jacob left Laban. Laban wasn't doing too well because the wealth had transferred from the hands of the sinner 
into the hands of a righteous man. He says, I've crossed over this Jordan with my staff, with a stick in my hand, and now I've become two companies. Think not today to tomorrow. Think long term and think generations. And think, God, where are you leading me in my path of prosperity? What do I need to do in order to come into a greater uh, prosperity so that I'm able to help the next generation? What can I do, God, in order to bring more wealth and, 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 and uh, money into my house? Because God wants his people wealthy. Remember, when you begin to prosper and you prosper more, the offspring is that in God's kingdom, when the tithe comes in, the tithe will also be more. So right there, and from a purely math mathematical point, God wants more money to come into the house so we can do more. And as I mentioned last week, we can, we can reach out. We've, we've got the funds and we've got the available f uh, money to do things and to preach the gospel in other places and to send people out and so forth. So God is absolutely a God of prosperity. He's not a God of poverty. So if you've poured into, the, into a poverty, poverty mentality, repent of it. Say, God, forgive me. I, I thought it was right. They told me it was right. But it's not right. Because the Bible says that God wants to prosper us. Last verse, Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We talked about that last week, that Christ has redeemed us. What is done on the cross of Calvary by shedding his blood, uh, by becoming cursed, as it were, on our behalf, so that the curse could be lifted off of us, um, and he's redeemed us from the curse, he's redeemed us from poverty. And in Christ, the blessing of Abraham is now available to non-Jewish people. Most of us are non-Jewish stock. The Bible calls us Gentile, Gentile believers rather than Jewish believers. But that blessing that God put, that promise that God put on Abraham, God wants that available to you and me today. Now, of course, the blessing goes way beyond money. All right. It's multiplication uh, that, we, you know, that in terms of uh, children and children's children, it's, it's justification by faith. Uh, it is that the, 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 the promise of the Spirit will come on, uh, on us by faith. And it says, I don't want to single one thing out over and above the others, but seeing we're talking about that, I want to focus on that. The blessing of Abraham wants to come into your house, wants to come on your life to bring great increase, to bring great, great prosperity, to enable you to be mighty upon the earth and to bring a greater influence for the kingdom of God in our nation. Let's pray. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net. We'll see you again soon.